Um, so, welcome to everyone who has joined our session. Uh, it is a, as I said earlier, that it, it is the best session of the day. And I, I challenge anyone to take issue with that particular characterization. Uh, so welcome to, to everyone who has, has found us. Um, just a, a few bits of housekeeping before we kick off. First, this is titled uh, Digital International Expansion. This is all about best practice in e-commerce when considering international and where to go outside of your, your home territory, how, why, and all of it wrapped up in one. And my name is Gabrielle Hayes. Just real quickly, uh, please always put um, questions in the chat bar. So we will have time for questions and the the more the better and you've got a huge brain trust here in our panel and our panelists today so i would recommend everyone to take advantage of it big time so I'll, I'll get to as many questions as possible at the end but just just by way of introduction my name is gabrielle hayes and i have worked in e-commerce worked in helping retailers and brands launch their e-commerce businesses uh for about 15 years Grew up in America and uh, have lived in the UK for, for 15 years. And I've over that time, I've worked with brands such as Sweaty Betty, uh, Moon Pig, a million years ago, but it remains a favorite brand, um, Arcadia, Sophie Hume, uh, The School of Life, uh, LK Bennett, and Hobbes. And uh, just have helped them in each of those, have, have helped understand what international means to the overall business strategy. So a lot of trading in the US, in Australia, and in Europe. So I'll ask the panel to introduce themselves uh, and, and in particular to highlight experience with international in doing so. So Claire, why don't we start with you? Hey everyone, thanks so much for having me. Really delighted to be here. My name's Claire. I currently um, are, I currently work at Unilever. I'm the VP of Global Ecom. My background is a real mixture. Uh, I started my career in a startup, which I just adored. It was the best six years of uh, my, uh, my life, definitely I would say. Um, and I had that experience of being a startup, then getting bought and doing integration. I then did a bit of consultancy. I then went to work for Virgin Atlantic to work on another startup, which failed miserably, but it was really great fun for a couple of years to try and make it work and also then eventually integrate it into the business. I then went on to Selfridges and headed up the kind of digital marketing side there for nearly six years and was part of the founding team of e-commerce, really looking at all markets of international expansion. And then I landed up at Unilever and today my biggest markets are China, India and the US. So I don't spend a huge amount of time working in the UK. So I guess my experience, been a mixture of startups, corporates uh, and a lot of international thrown in there as well. Great. Thanks. Nicole? Yeah, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, I have worked in a lot of places around the world, but most recently, my uh, my sort of biggest international role was running the international business for Etsy for about eight years, where we invested primarily in the UK, France and Germany, Canada and Australia. But we also went to India while I was there, which was an interesting experience in internationalization. Um, but I have also spent time at um, a startup in the UK called MyDeco, at Bebo, where I looked after the international business. Um, at Google, where I got the opportunity to live in India, uh, and before that at Amex, where I got the opportunity to live in Japan. So originally American, but have spent time in lots of different places. There are a lot of frequent flyer miles between this group, I'm sure. Lisa? Hi, everybody. I'm Lisa Rodwell. This is really fun, and thanks for inviting me. Um, by my accent, you may think that I'm from the US behind me, but I'm actually from Canada. Um, and my career really spans both corporates early on, then startup scale up back to startup. Um, and, you know, if I look at my first sort of consumer tech business that I worked on, it was at eBay and it was in Canada. We were the first international market when I joined. So it was a, it was a long time ago, early 2002. And so I experienced the whole international expansion of eBay as 
as one of the international markets. And then, you know, my career took me actually over to the UK and I worked for another uh, large um, tech business, Yahoo, working after their European uh, businesses, very different online dating, search, you name it. And then I jumped into the, the startup space and um, I joined a uh, 15 people at Moo.com, an online printing company, and saw that scale from headquarters in, in the UK, but really serving an international footprint. Primary, our biggest market was the US, but we also had, uh, gosh, order, orders coming in from probably over 80 different countries. Uh, then kind of went to another startup, Wool in the Gang, which is sort of fashion meets DIY. Again, running from the UK, um, an international footprint, start very sort of startup, uh, scale up, taking, you know, different approaches to different markets. And then more recently, after um, spending some time in fintech, I've been working with a couple um, online retailers, one early stage business, you know, just launched this year called Swift Home. And they're primarily in the UK, but we're looking at what does that international expansion look like? So I guess the themes are consumer facing businesses, tech enabled, usually at the innovation stage. That's great. I mean, what you guys don't know about international isn't worth oh, knowing. I, know. <laughs> I think there's well, always well. lots to learn from everybody. But, but that's that's a brilliant point because it it is a moving target. And it it just because you might have done it a year ago or two years ago, it feels like you're always starting from square one because things change so quickly. Um, certainly not, you know, you can build up an experience in this. So, Nicole, I'd like to, to start with you real quickly. Um, first of all, the, the breadth of experience here is really interesting because it's from scale up, from startup to scale up and enterprise and marketplace. And a lot of people who are listening can can latch on to, to one of those at least and, and have personal experience with it. Where you take your business internationally is always a big question and how you do it. So, so Nicole, if you could um, let me in a little bit on, on the thought process in the different businesses you've, you've been in, um, how do you, when you think about international, how do you approach it? Meaning, has it always been the one strategic driver? Has it been um, something to think about when, after you've, you've done, you know, put out this fire, I know Etsy, you were head of international, so that was your job. Uh, but but it'd be interesting just to get a lens on on how you looked at it or where it's where it's at. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think one of the things that's changed in the last say ten or fifteen years is, you know, it used to be that you started a business and they were these silos. So like I, I imagine Lisa will relate to this with eBay, where it was sort of almost like you copy and paste and you start the whole thing over. Tree and press. I, my eight years at Etsy felt really different because whether we liked it or not, we sort of had users for in 200 countries, you know, that just from day one. And so I think this probably applies to Etsy as a big platform, but also to anybody as small as the people selling on Etsy is kind of like it or not, you're global already, I guess is what I would say. And so I think the, you know, the trick is trying to figure out what tools can help you scale quickly. There's a lot of great, because of that dynamic, a lot of great tools out there. So whether it be, you know, Google Translate helping you with your customer service and markets where you don't have people speaking that language or a company that I sit on the board of called Gelato, which can help you print things around the world with the push of a button. You know, there are lots of tools out there that help you scale. Um, that said, I think one of the hardest things about my job at Etsy was trying to prioritize because at the end of the day, while you want to sort of step carefully into a market and test it out and, you know, in a digital world, you don't have to make a big upfront investment necessarily um, to go into a market. You do want to be in a position where you are investing deliberately and trying to see deliberate returns. And that's hard to do even for, for example, in more than a handful of markets, I think. Um, so I think, especially while you're little, you know, I've been at the entrepreneur end of this, it's hard to say no to opportunities because they all seem juicy and exciting and like how there's like a romance to getting orders from Japan, <laughs> you know, and from places that are, you know, all around the world. But I think, you know, my biggest piece of advice, while it sounds like a cliche, is at the end of the day, you need to pick like, okay, which are the markets where 
we're really going to get a reliable stream of income and we're going to make very deliberate investments um, because it's <laughs> you're global now, whether you like it or not. So it's, it's hard to make those trade-offs. Thanks. But Lisa, picking up on, on Nicole's point about, you know, it's hard to say no and you, but that you do have to prioritize. What's some of the that you've used in the past to prioritize yeah. and to determine where to put that investment? Yeah, I think uh, taking some indicators from your early uh, successes. So if I, if I look at both Moo.com and Will and the Gang, some of the things that Nicole said sounded so familiar. You know, as an early stage business, you're looking for revenue everywhere. So your early stage, we had all these uh, people at Moo coming in from Japan, but after learning a little bit more about that market, which, you know, at the stage, that stage, we didn't know that much. We realized, well, we're getting these early adopters. We just could not scale. So I think, I think you take as much sort of research you can get from uh, sales indicators and then find out more about the market before you jump right in. One of the things that we did, like, for example, uh, with Wool and the Gang, actually with Canada, I mentioned before I'm from Canada. I mean, we had a, a big influx of uh, customer service requests asking for people to or for us to sell to that market but it was just when we learned more about the uh, duties and the complications we just felt like it's not worth it but you always hate to say no so is there other opportunities you can look for so in that case we got partner retailers um, so we could focus on the markets that made sense um, I think I guess it's it's really not only taking the indicators, but then figuring out, you know, how quickly can you scale and what's involved in the investment. To Nicole's point, you've got to put, you know, people and resources against it to make sense. Otherwise, you're just throwing, you're you're throwing yourself at all those different sides, or you're throwing resources and and nothing returns. Mm -hmm. And Claire, in your your experience, obviously you're at Unilever now. You've had uh, smaller scale experience in the back in in your background with regards to um, working on startups but you're a startup within within Unilever but you let's just play devil's advocate you have all the resources you could throw well that's the perception you could throw something at every territory under the sun so how do you prioritize yeah you know it's it's such a good question and a dilemma and um, that you've got. And when I look at what's happened over the last, um, uh, you know, six months or so, when you look at e-commerce, gosh, this acceleration has happened in a couple of months, really, that we hadn't, you know, the same growth was there ten, over 10 years. So we are experiencing in all markets around the world a very big channel shift. Um, and therefore, it's forced us to um, actually invest in a channel that perhaps in other nascent markets, we wouldn't have done it just yet. So I was just with our Vietnam team on Friday and you know they were already, they were probably 1% of their market was coming through e-commerce in terms of total turnover. Already in this uh, you know six month period, suddenly 8% of their sales are coming. And you know that that market has still got huge room for growth. So I guess you know we we are in a position where we can invest for growth, um, and that's you know one of the great things of being in the size of the company that I am in now. But if I liken it into my past, you've got to make choices. But you know what I what I would say is where you then focus, you've got to be able to take learnings really quickly. Because, and I think this is the great space about working in digital, is that you can get learnings really quickly and get out if you're not seeing some of the traction early. Um, because you're not going to be clearly be able to operate in 190 countries like Unilever can, but we've got resources and wealth to be able to do that. So, you know, being really early on and, and being really careful in looking at your competition. What are other people doing in the space? What can you learn from them? So before you go, 
um, fully into a market, there's so much learnings that you can garner from other people and what they're doing by just doing your homework or just simply picking up your mobile phone and going and have a look at how other brands are representing themselves or using a tool like SimilarWeb where you can see how they're getting their traffic. So really doing your homework, but equally, if you're learning, learn fast, fail fast mentality. That's something I've you know, really been trying to bring into um, Unilever before we invest too much and pull out if we're not seeing the returns. So a, a question that I get from some of the brands uh, who I work with, um, and forgive me, I'm springing this question on you guys. You have had no time to prep for it, but we're gonna think fast, is, um, and a lot of the brands I work with are, are definitely uh, from the UK, they're, they're American, Australian. And the question is, how much focus do we put on Asia? specifically in China. And because a few years ago, if you didn't have a presence there, if you weren't there in some way, uh, you're just dead in the water. And why on earth are you not spending a lot of money to be in Asia, despite the fact that you might not know anything about it, which might be good advice. And then I think it feels like now everybody's taking a little bit more of a, of a considered approach, both because people haven't done it well. It is a completely different cultural experience for a lot of people, not not everyone. Um, but how have you guys handled this in your own businesses, Lisa? How do you how have you looked eastward? Yeah, I mean, I would say um, Wool and the Gang actually was my uh, is the example I'll take, and it was it goes back to where was their indicators of sales. So it wasn't like we looked at Asia and went, ooh, let's go to Asia, which we don't know at all on the team. We really didn't. Europe and, and North America and Australia, we could, we could handle. But actually, we started to see the sales and we started to see it, see it both through retail. And it was at that point that we realized actually our brand stood for something there. And, but we still knew we didn't have the expertise on the team. Um, we actually worked with uh, some of the the UK bodies to uh, governmental bodies to help us kind of better understand. But also we found a partner there um, and, and we set up a partnership relationship who we, we really trusted. Um, and actually, to be honest, some of the bigger companies helped us out. Farfetch was amazing at giving us some insight into, uh, you know, South Korea was a huge market for us. And they told us more about what our brand meant there. Now, that was quite a unique situation. I, I think I would honestly not jump to go to a market I didn't have expertise or someone on the team to have expertise. Because at the end of the day, you got to understand the consumers and you got to understand the market. Um, but if there's if there really is an opportunity, then perhaps you invest in that. But um, in at least that research phase. Mm -hmm. Nicole, you've done a lot in in the East, haven't you? Well, we ha didn't do Etsy actually, and um, the it, it's funny because every time somebody knew that was senior at Etsy, they would ask me this question: China, why aren't we in Japan? <laughs> and um, my team and I had this, like, to go back to Lisa's thing about indicators, we had this, like, very simple two by two that was the potential of a market and then the ease of the entry into the market or the investment required to get there. And so, you know, the investment required for us, again, I think every, you know, product and service is different. But as a platform going into, you know, double bite characters and looking at the regulatory constraints, um, mm -hmm. it pretty quickly meant that like China and Japan looked like these enormous opportunities, but they were very far over on the other dimension. And so uh, I didn't spend a lot of time talking about this at Etsy, but it's funny, every time somebody senior would come in, they would sort of ask the question and we would have that conversation. But we were, you know, I, I would say maybe I felt... Um, proud of our ability to resist some like sort of faddish um, desire for us to move in that direction in some ways because of the investment required. And that's an opportunity cost to not invest in markets that are more, again, when you're not maybe Unilever and you have more constrained resource, you, you know, you could be investing in getting France to be instead of, you know, trying to figure out the regulatory environment in China around a marketplace platform. Now, what I will say is that we did that. I think there's sounds like there's commonality with Claire is we we did go into India. And I think that's an interesting market, again, depending on your product or service for a lot of reasons, just because 
it is a very outward looking country. It's very English proficient. There's a very large, you know, middle class um, growing there that don't behaviorally look all that dissimilar to Western Europeans in some ways when you look at a certain segment. Um, so for us, we found that to be a much, you know, again, on that dimension of ease or investment required, we found that to be a much more attractive market than some of the markets that were further east. There. Gabrielle, you want me to add to it? I mean, I, I guess I'll talk about a couple of experiences. You know, when I was at Selfridges, we clearly, if you only have to go to Oxford Street and see that, um, you know, the brand had a huge penetration with Chinese tourists. So there was a clear opportunity. Now, we, what's quite interesting, if you look at um, the UK, there's a big proportion of Chinese students that buy luxury goods. So we already had um, a big Chinese population that were, um, uh, you know, spending with us. And um, you can, can take a lot of learnings actually by looking at Chinese communities, um, certainly in your kind of market of origin, I would say. But I, you know, and I think what Lisa and kind of Nicole said, I would echo, I think going into China requires the right strategic partnership you do need people on the ground. And I have to reflect from my experience of now going to Unilever, from the learnings that we really took from um, Selfridges, we didn't probably really scratch the surface of the opportunity um, by actually having the right agency partner, the right fulfillment partner. It is an amazing market, but it is fundamentally different. The ecosystem is different, technology is different, uh, the use of your mobile to pay for everything, the culture is completely different. So you can't underestimate the taking that really requires to win in China. And you know, when I now look at Unilever, we've got 150 uh, strong team when it comes to really um, driving e-commerce. But when we look at some of the local players there, their ability to bring innovation, speed, and extract the fantastic market that is there is second to none. So the local players are really able to move with such agility. So I think China, without a doubt, is inc incredible. I think there's a couple of people here that have kind of said they're doing beauty startups. Oh my God, it's like beauty on speed. And it's so amazing. And the trends that I can see coming from the East and really bringing that to the West are really incredible. So even if you're not in China, you need to know what's happening there because this kind of real trend space coming from east to west mm -hmm. really look for that kind of future opportunity but i would definitely say having a partner and having people that know the market is just absolutely critical to be able to succeed there well it, it's interesting i'll i'll bring it uh and look westward a bit because i think we've all had experience on this call being in the uk and working with uk brands who think oh America's huge. We can go over there and we'll get tons of sales really quickly because it's the same language and it's kind of the same culture, isn't it? And you think, oh, no, 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 no. So in a very subtle but no less uh, profound way, I think uh, America is seen as a very big market. There are challenges that people have to consider um, when going there as well. Uh, but it, again, it just comes down to understanding and, and being open to figuring out where the gaps are. So which brings me to the question I think a lot of people who are listening today um, will be very important for them, which is to say, wh what would you do central and what would you do local? So Nicole, you mentioned, okay, he, making a decision to invest. And once you do that, what does investment look like? Or what takes a country or a territory from the, we're getting inbound interest, interesting, it's one to watch, to, okay, this is one of two or three or five regions that we're actually going to do some investment in. What does that look like? Does it mean hiring one person in Central to own it? Does it mean um, translating the website? Does it mean uh, hiring somebody in market? I know it's a variation of all of those things, but if you guys could could help me uh, put some color to the to the question, that would be great. Yeah. Who wants to start? Oh, I was. Oh, Nicole, go ahead. I was just going to jump in. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think what I've learned over the years is to try to centralize as much as you can, right, and invest in the things that are truly unique to that market, as, because it frees you up to make that investment in the market. So. 
at Etsy, we did sort of the obvious things very centrally. So like performance marketing, we spent loads of money on Google. That is, you know, an, a highly scientific process, largely quantitative and doesn't require a huge amount of market context to get done fairly well. So that was done by a bunch of people in Brooklyn. Similarly, building products, believe it or not, was largely done by teams centralized in the U.S. Now we had a, a ring fence, a ring fenced set of resources that we could prioritize their work for the international team, but they were really worked very closely with the product team in the U.S. The thing for that uh, that I think is often required is um, a certain type of marketing, right? So not performance-based marketing, but the things that are a little bit more subtle. Um, and at Etsy in particular, building up the supply side was very local. So just to, I'll give you one quick example and then I'll, I'll let the others jump in. But building up supply in a lot of our markets around the world was mostly a marketing exercise, you know, trying to get in front of the right people. But when we went into India, to Claire's good point, we looked around at like, well, how does everybody else do this in India? And it turns out, you know, whether you're Uber or um, uh, another kind of platform, like people get on mopeds and they go around the cities and they sit down with these small businesses and they help them set up with a laptop, <laughs> you know, so they, it's really a um, very entrepreneurial sales process that happens. And so we had to do a little bit of convincing of headquarters that we were going to do this thing that seems sort of crazy. <laughs> Um, but within a very short period of time, by sort of like testing and iterating and stepping our way into it, we gained confidence that it was the right thing to do there. And so that was managed by an amazing India MD that we hired and he was, you know, had the freedom and resource to do that. But most of the product issues were still managed centrally and his Google spend was still managed centrally. So it freed him up to focus on that bit that linked to India for us. Yeah. Talk about, you know, feet on the ground. Quite literal. Yeah. Lisa? On mute. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe we'll talk a couple of examples. I think Nicole's right, like, um, centralize uh, as much as you can. Um, and actually thinking about my experience way back when at eBay, you know, at first they had everybody all around the world and then since then they, they centralized back. But um, if I look at Moo.com and their expansion from day one, uh, while it was a UK business, 60% of the sales was in the US. That was day one. And that was just because of how we launched and we launched with partnerships in the US. Um, actually, I believe Bebo was one of them, but they were. Um, so that, that changed how we actually evolved as a business and how we went internationally because we were managing so much centrally from the beginning. But what we found out within a year or two, um, we were missing, we were missing opportunities and we were missing them because we, we weren't on the ground enough. We did a lot of travel. So if you don't have someone in the market, you need to, you need to know the market, you need to go and visit it and so forth, particularly when it's things like events or, you know, if you ever had, you know, pop-ups or what have you, you have to think about those sort of marketing initiatives where it really does make sense to get sort of face to face with people because, you know, brands aren't all built online. Um, and I think having definitely from early days, having someone responsible for a market is critical because otherwise no one is really taking, uh, res well, no one's really responsible for the KPIs. And I think that that's really like a small company trying to go to many, uh, uh, many markets at once. Um, so it was, we ultimately opened up an office uh, and actually there's a couple offices now in the US at Moo. Um, even though it's by far the the, the biggest part of that business. Um, and now some of the central marketing is done from there and managing back to the rest of the world. So I guess the, you know, the heart of the business, the, the heart of the marketing is where in the biggest market. But interesting as to when you actually put a headcount yeah, in the market. Yeah, it was a couple that's of years a, and we made some mistakes. Yeah. Um, we thought that we were being quirky and British and that everybody would like us. And they did, the early adopters. But to get the mass US, they didn't really want us to be a British company. Um, and I think it was that realization and understanding that that was no longer part of the brand story. And how did we, how do we play in that market? Same for, you know, France and Germany. Like you can't just... You, you can't just try to translate something and hope. <laughs> that was fun what we did. It didn't work. 
sure. Claire, do you have any? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I would just add this, this sense of being global, you know, what, what can be truly global versus really needs to be localized. And, you know, they, I've seen the good and bad and ugly, um, you know, as well. And I've definitely made a lot of mistakes. And I, and I truly think it's about assessing in your particular business area. So, you know, I'm just seeing here Carissa's, you know, building a sustainable fashion business, you know, what's going to be really important um, thinking about that is ethical sourcing. Is that going to be localized? Is that going to be, you know, looking at your supply chain? Is that really clear and transparent? So I think it comes back to the purpose of your company as well. You know, the purpose of you as founders, you know, what are the things that you stay and hold true to? Because they can be really compromised. You start to internationalize. So, um, you know, being really clear, I think there's things like content we've, you know, I've personally found easier to be global and then localized through trans, um, you know, through translation search as kind of Nicole's kind of talked about, but then even product innovation, some of that you can do globally, definitely, but then there are local nuances. It could be fragrance, it could be packaging, it could be some things that you really need to think about. So this sense around, you know, I love what Lisa kind of said, we, we took some learnings and then actually we made the decision because we thought we'd been quirky and British and being like, you sometimes you're going to have to learn as you go here. Um, and there's nothing wrong with learning, but I think you've got to do it in, in probably what I was saying earlier. Don't take ages to learn, you know, make some decision points about your critical success criteria or being, you know, when do we make that decision? Because um, it can be really painful to learn from those mistakes and, and really costly then to rectify them. So I think, you know, the sense of being local, there's great businesses like the Hut Group. I was learning about them um, only really recently. I mean, you know, their workforce is mainly in Manchester. Um, yet 70% of their sales are from around the globe. And they've really positioned themselves as a technology company. And now they're able to, within four weeks, scale a dispatch center all around the world because they've got the right core uh, technology and capability. So again, you know, thinking about, you know, the internet, I guess, is boundless. And, you know, we, we're creating this borderless um, world now. So there's a lot that can be, but you do really need to think about the areas that truly do need to be local. And, and you as business owners, I guess, would know that better than anyone. And there's always going to be a little bit of emotion that comes into play as well um, when it comes to brand values and, and things like that. Um, we have five minutes left. I had a, a quick question uh, before one final question. So the quick question is, when you think about how being a British brand uh, in a different country. When do you stop using British spellings? Because I've had this conversation with business owners that says that's 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 our brand, and, and they're right. That's their brand. That's the quirky. That's the you know we're not hiding. We're not pretending that we're not British. But when do you? When does that stop being a brand thing and start being a you know just make it easier for people to understand? And I, I can see both sides. So well, we have to think of SEO as well. Always SEO. Yes. Yeah, I mean, if, if I was to answer that, I mean, I, I mentioned the, the point about Moo. Uh, I mean, we, we, it was a couple of years before we actually introduced a US website, which then we had the copy and so forth uh, Americanized. Um, and even, you know, the turn of phrase, uh, because we saw that it wasn't, it was no longer helping us. But Actually, you know, if, if it's if it doesn't cause you a lot of trouble, people will think it's a mistake. I'm sorry to say. I mean, I don't know. Maybe things have got a bit better, but we would get comments all the time that we have spelling mistakes. And actually, going going beyond Moo, actually at Will and the Gang, we ran into other issues because it's um, craft and fashion, and the craft part they use different stitch names, different ways of saying things there. And we just kept like plowing on with the way we did it. And actually that was detrimental to the product actually. So, you know, you really go have to go back to what the consumers make sense for the consumers. I mean, that's what we're here for. We're not here for ourselves. Um, so I'd say sooner rather than later personally. Okay. We're going to do a, a quick round, quick fire round. Uh, and that is what is the one thing you wish you'd never done? or something that somebody you should never do. So you're talking to people who are thinking about where to go, that they want to be international, that they want to trade cross-border. 
if you can look at them and say, for the love of God, make sure you don't, what is it, Nicole? Um, I guess <laughs> I would say, like, I would reiterate what I said earlier, which is don't try to go everywhere all at once. Yeah. And try to like test and iterate. And to me, the the like real art of strategy just in general is where will the fact that you're doing something actually matter? So like if it's just coming to you easily, I'll give it a quick example. It's a beautiful Lithuanian sellers on Etsy. And every year somebody would ask me, what are we going to do to like make sure that that and I was like, make sure that what like it is coming to us anyway, because of the nature of that market. And so I think to be like really deliberate and see where, where if I do something specific, will something change in that market is like the real test of what. Uh... Mm -hmm. That's great. Claire? Yeah, I would really echo what Nicole said. Don't spread yourself too thinly. Um, I think really critical that you've got some successes um, and focus on one or two markets and get those yes. right, rather than trying to be everything to everyone because that's where you can just scale too soon. So being able to be, and, and be clear about what success mm -hmm. looks like um, and hold yourself to that. And what are being some of the things that you're gonna live and die on a sword by that you won't compromise? Um, and so being clear on that um, and um, focus and get learnings quickly. Um, yeah, those would be my, my, my tips. Got it. Lisa, I, I think, you're going to see us. Yeah, I think particularly if you're going to a country where English isn't the first language, like get the translation right. There's so many, you know, it was so easy back in, to get these Fringlish sites that it's just it's just embarrassing and it and it's not a good step forward. So if you're going to do it, do it right with you know someone on the team and make sure you've got the technology to allow for the translation. Don't try to do sort of this half-ass job. I've been in that position. And it just was a waste of time <laughs> and money. And it's embarrassing. Well, this is great advice. There's a huge world out there. And uh, and I can't thank you enough for all of your insights. And I, I know that the everyone on who's listening today um, has left will have left this chat smarter than when they joined. So that's a credit to you. And thank you so much. I think what is happening now is a uh, brief networking session, 15 minute networking session. So you can go to the left of the networking tab, click on that, say hello, and and then think about your inter international strategy. I mean, that's what I'm gonna do. So, <laughs> and everyone for joining. Bye guys. Thanks. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you.